Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? And welcome. I'm doing great. Thank you. All right. So I guess we're doing uh, more of a Q&A session than a presentation. It's going to be a combination. I'm going to talk, but I want everyone to know that I'm very interested in answering questions um, because some people have heard me before and want to have follow up on something that may be stuck in their mind. And some people haven't heard me, in which case I might be going way advanced compared to what they need to know about the basics of GMOs. So we have the time. So um, I'm going to speak on a few things here and there. And uh, but I'm also going to be um, asking people to ask me their questions by raising their hand at a certain point and several times throughout the two hours. All right, great. And just so everybody knows how to how to raise the hand, raise their hand. Um, in order to do so on the, the second button from the right at the bottom of the Zoom, there, there's a button called Reactions. You're going to click on that. And then from there, you will select Raise Hand. Um, and then uh, Jeff will be able to see that you've raised your hand. And then he'll unmute you and you can ask your question. All right. So you can go ahead and and you want to start off by, you know, kind of giving a prelude to the, to the topic. And then. Sure. Perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. Hello. I've, this is, I've been doing the uh, real truth about health since the very first uh, year. And um, it's exciting to be part of this. And I know that there's more people who are going to see this after today and when it gets repurposed and sent out. But for those who are here now, you know that it's Mother's Day. And so I want to start by speaking to Mother's Day. Um, with GMOs, it's an interesting thing in that you can avoid the mother. You can create new organisms without sexual intercourse, without uh, you know, birds and the bees. You can create new organisms uh, that, that don't resemble sexual reproduction. And in that sense, you're taking over a very important job. Um, now, when one of the things that I think about in terms of mothering, uh, Mother's Day is the mothering instinct of animals and humans, and it's a precious, natural, uh, important part of biology and of life. And I remember my friend um, from the Center for Food Safety uh, tell me that the early attempts for genetic engineering, one of them was to genetically engineer out the mothering instinct, to eliminate the mothering instinct of livestock so that you could take their babies away and they won't care. And this was um, to Andy Kimbrell, who told me this, an example of the most, one of the most egregious things that we can do with genetic engineering is to eliminate the mothering instinct. And it certainly is a huge violation of natural law, in my opinion, uh, as is a lot of aspects of industrial agriculture. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mothering piece for a second because of Mother's Day. And then we're going to jump into uh, deeper knowledge about GMO 2.0. In fact, we're going to start with the microbiome right now. The importance of a healthy microbiome in the infant which is the bacteria and other microbes throughout the body of the, of the infant, but particularly in the gut and within that, particularly in the large intestine. It is so important that when it is properly established, it helps that child's health for the rest of their life and can be passed on to future generations. If a child has a C-section, often the health is compromised because the child gets inoculated with certain microbes in the birth canal during the birthing process. In fact, in the second trimester, milk digesting bacteria move into the birth canal. And that is one of the things that inoculates the infant so that they can digest milk, so that their microbes can digest milk. And part of the milk from the mother during breastfeeding is not designed for the infant. 
It is indigestible by the infant. It stays intact through the stomach, through the small intestine, to feed the microbes in the large intestine. So we have evolved as a species to provide microbes for the infant, to nourish the microbes of the infant, and more microbes come through the milk from the mother, and more microbes come from the nipple on the skin, so maybe 28% of the of the microbes in the in the gut of the infant come from the milk about 10 percent from the nipple some come from the birthing process all fed by the by the part of the milk that is not designed to feed the infant but it gets even more interesting when the infant gets sick somehow the milk changes to support the sick infant how does that happen because the microbes in the saliva of the infant change and feedback through the breast to the mother's microbiome and that changes the nature of the milk to support the health of the baby. It's absolutely incredible. But less so when we realize that we are not just human individuals. We have a community inside us that has co-evolved with us for as long as humanity has evolved. And we can get away with a measly 23,000 genes. Be that's less than an earthworm. Because we use the microbiome information of the 3.5 million genes and the microbes living inside us. And we've also outsourced a lot of the daily metabolic and chemical functions to the microbiome. Maybe uh, Karen Krishnan, who's an expert, the human microbiome, he, he thinks about 90%. There are things that we can't do that only the microbes inside of us can do. They can tell if there's a particular cell that needs to be repaired along the gut walls. We have no way of knowing that except for the microbes living inside us. Dr. Dietrich Klinghart tells me that when they reduce the amount of microbiomes of the bacteria and, and bugs in our brain, yes, they're in our brain, our IQ goes down. How is it that the bugs in our brain support intelligence. There's a programming in the microbes that we don't understand. And it is so intelligent, it carries in many ways the imprint or the blueprint or the current reading of the health of our body. So much so, some of you don't know about this, there's a technique called fecal transplant. Yes, it's exactly what you just thought. It's done with rats and mice and humans. And I'll give you a story that my friend, Dr. David Perlmutter told me. He said there was a 12 year old boy, I think it was 12 year old, who was autistic, could hardly speak. He ran into the mother at, in a parking lot and ended up engaging in a conversation. And he told her, he recommended a fecal transplant. You take fecal matter from a healthy person and put it in a suppository in a specific way, and she decided to go forward with it. They did it in England. Two weeks later, the 12-year-old boy was speaking in full sentences. He showed me a picture when I was visiting him in his house, this is David Perlmutter, of a, of a rat. I don't know if it's a rat or a mouse exhibiting autistic symptoms, and they did a fecal transplant from a healthy animal, and those went away. Sometimes after a fecal transplant, people get heavy or thin. It turns out that the nature of the bacteria living inside us can dictate how heavy or thin we are. It can dictate, the bacteria and the microbiome inside us can tell us 
to desire a cupcake because it needs sugar. It can tell us to desire social interaction because it wants more microbial diversity. And if, it, if we do something that it wants, it can stimulate the reward center and train us to be supporters of its community. The microbes make the happy chemical precursors, L-tryptophan and tyrosine are produced by the microbes inside of us, which then become serotonin and dopamine. And the serotonin becomes melatonin. So it produces happy chemicals. And if we understand the microbes, that's micro Jedi army that's working inside us, we get to appreciate it and love it. If a woman has breast cancer, certain type of bacteria moves into the breast. They thought it was a bad thing. They killed the bacteria. The cancer spread. It was to contain certain fungi move into the brain during Alzheimer's to help protect the brain. We don't realize how much support we are getting from this unseen kingdom, kingdoms. But it's not just inside us. It's also in the soil. A healthy microbial system can produce healthy, nutrient-rich crops that can resist disease and don't need chemicals for survival. The microbes draw down the carbon from the air, often through the plants. Microbes can condense water vapor in the atmosphere to create rain. They can align um, water molecules and refrigerate them so they can become snow or frost at higher temperatures. There are extremophiles that live inside volcanoes and at the bottom of the depths of the ocean. Using laws of nature, we don't fully understand. Now, what's interesting about the microbes is that unless we do something, Genetic engineering could begin to destroy the microbiomes inside of us, in the soil, in the atmosphere. You see, micro we already said a fecal transplant, just a small amount of fecal matter from a different person or a different animal can change the nature of a person's health. Slight changes of, in the microbiome from antibiotics or the addition of certain probiotics can make significant changes. In fact, it's the changes in the microbes inside of us that can give rise to 80% of the diseases we face, according to Karen Krishnan. 80%. You can find their source, among other things, as the changes in the microbiome. Now, we're, let's talk about genetic engineering in terms of genetically engineering microbes. And for those that have a pen and paper, I'd like you to write down this website, responsibletechnology.org slash take action. Responsibletechnology.org slash take action. We'll come back to that. So if you, genetic, if you genetically engineer a microbe and you put it outside, take it for a walk, first of all, they replicate very fast. The numbers are stunning. The numbers are so big, it's hard to really put them into perspective. Some will die in the, in the environment, but some will survive. Then they can travel. We did not need a pandemic to know that microbes can travel. In fact, my friend, Dr. Elaine Ingham, tells me that she was approached by whistleblowers at the EPA. They told her that they did a study to see how far genetically engineered bacteria would travel. So they created some nitrogen fixing bacteria genetic, through genetic engineering, released it in a field in Louisiana and set up monitoring stations. They found it at least 11 miles away the next year, another 11 miles the next year. They stopped funding the study at some point, but members of the EPA 
who were curious and concerned, they continued to monitor for the presence of this genetically engineered bacteria. And it turns out they eventually found it everywhere they checked, all over the planet. So if you release a genetically engineered microbe, it might go everywhere. And it contains changes in its genetic code, possibly in its activity, possibly in, the, in its byproducts that it creates, possibly in its interactions, that have never co-evolved with us. And it may change the way a pretty critical microbe functions, one that may be important for our health, important for the soil, important for the algae, which produce 70% of the Earth's oxygen, or the fungi networks underneath, underneath forest floors that shuttle nutrients between mother trees and other trees, speaking of Mother's Day, and can help the young trees that are not yet above the canopy. They're not getting any sunlight, but they're getting the nutrients from the trees that are at the canopy because it's transferred through fungal networks. So just like the magic inside us, there's a magic inside the whole world, in the oceans, in the forests, from these microbes. But if we introduce a genetically engineered microbe into the mix, we might destroy the nature of nature, damage the ecosystem, or collapse it, cause disease. Now, what's interesting about microbes is that when they travel, they also mutate. Everyone knows about mutations now. We had a lesson on that over the last three years. Most people don't realize that many microbes transfer genes to other microbes. They transfer genes to other microbes. It's called horizontal gene transfer. There's three ways that microbes do it. And if you genetically engineer a microbe, change a genetic sequence, add a trait, it travels, it mutates, and now it's like changing, you know, like exchanging baseball cards or Dungeon and Dragon cards. It's exchanging it with other microbes around the world that they in turn travel, mutate, and exchange microbes. And they in turn travel and mutate and exchange microbes. Now, that's a kind of genetic roulette, which happens to be the name of one of my movies and one of my books. And here it's very, very relevant. What could go wrong? I'm going to give you an example of what could go wrong as a worst case scenario. One of many. On our website, you can go to the and see the film. Don't let the gene out of the bottle. In the beginning, I interviewed Dr. Elaine Ingham. She had a graduate student. The graduate student wanted to get his PhD doing research on a genetically engineered microbe that would survive in the wild. So they found a group that was genetically engineering bacterium called Klebsiella planticula. Elaine tells me it's on the root structure of every single plant in the world. But this genetically engineered variety was engineered to produce alcohol out of plant cells. And it was a very well-meaning, potentially brilliant, potentially cataclysmic idea to distribute the bacteria to farmers who can then take their crop residues and instead of burn them, put them into barrels with the bacteria. And then two weeks later, it would come out as alcohol to run their tractors or sell for additional money. And then there was nutrient-rich sludge at the bottom, which was going to make great fertilizer. So this group was ready to go. And they had already done all the tests required by the Environmental Protection Agency. And it was, it was stunning. It was ready to go. And it was set for a date to release to see how far it would spread. This was before Elaine Ingham had been approached by the EPA, where we know that can spread around the world. Two weeks before that date where it was going to be released, her graduate student walked into the lab on it was a Saturday morning and was mortified 
and called Elaine at home and was just beside himself. So many of his plants had died. He thought he screwed it up and was going to not be able to submit the research to get his PhD. So Elaine tells me, so let's, this is what I did. I just told him, let's sort through, take the ones that were, you know, they had three different groups. They had ones that were grown in regular soil, ones that were grown in soil with the normal Klebsiella planticula, and then the third one where it was the genetically engineered Klebsiella planticula. Only that group that had been mixed with the genetically engineered bacterium died. It had turned the plants into alcohol. It was slime on the surface of the soil. I asked Elaine what might happen if the graduate student never did that study and they released the genetically engineered alcohol-producing bacteria. She said, worst case scenario, and this, by the way, is a really bad scenario, the end of terrestrial plant life. Think about it. Imagine that this bacterium, that all this bacteria spreads and starts destroying plants. It may kill its parent natural version that may die in the presence of alcohol, but the genetically engineered variety doesn't. So it may displace that niche on the root structure of all the plants, and it's found everywhere. And she said, how would you stop it? You can watch the film. Don't let the gene out of the bottle. Now, this is an example of a microbe that could cause theoretically, we don't know if it would have because there's a lot of ifs, caused a cataclysm simply by doing the job it was intended to do, although doing it better and in more ecosystems than had been considered. We didn't even have to think about swapping the genes with other microbes. So now you have all these different microbes creating alcohol. We didn't think about the mutations that might result. This is just doing what it was what it was meant to do. We also didn't think about the fact that the genetic engineering process causes massive collateral damage and ends up doing changes that are unpredicted. And we'll talk about that later. This is just Assuming that the genetic engineering was, was precise, which it usually isn't, safe, which it usually isn't, that alone could have potentially ended terrestrial plant life. They're releasing genetically engineered bacterium, bacteria in, on farm fields that, that fix nitrogen. And they're saying, oh, good, we don't have to use nitrogen fertilizer. So it won't get washed into the Mississippi and brought into the Gulf and create dead zones where there, when there's an overabundance of nitrogen, then it kills off all of the life because there's a bloom and all that. But what happens if the bacteria that, that fixes nitrogen gets swept into the Mississippi and brought down? Maybe it'll transfer into algae. Maybe it'll transfer into other microbes there producing nitrogen. So you have algae that might produce its own dead zones. That's an example. I asked Kieran Krishnan, can you think of a agricultural um, biological intervention through genetic engineering that might hurt human health? Instantly he said this, when you release something in the soil, you want it to survive. Microbes don't always survive. You need to build a survival mechanism. And it often has two components. It's antimicrobial. It kills off the competition. It's also antibiotic resistant, not killable with antibiotics. So it's like building a tank around this nitrogen fixing microbe. Forget about the nitrogen fixing. What if the tank transfers? What if we eat it because there's some soil residue on the food and we eat it? And we do bring in soil residue into our mouths all the time. And what if that tank that helps provide 
extra survival becomes incorporated into a pathogen, a dangerous, negative microbe inside our gut. Now, a lot of microbes are there that are positive and negative, but when they're in the proper ratio, it's fine. Some of those so-called negative ones have an important job and they're used as part of this mix. But what happens if it becomes antimicrobial and starts killing off? What if it becomes antibiotic resistant so you can't treat it? So now you've ended up transferring genetic material that were genetically engineered from soil into human gut bacteria. There was a genetically engineered microbe that was created to stop a, uh, this other microbe that causes that rain and snow and sleet and, and ice and frost, Pseudomonas syringae. It's on strawberries. It's on potatoes. So at higher temperatures, frost will occur and the crops can become damaged. So they created a genetically engineered version that was impotent and they were hoping it would replace the one that was effective so that it would prevent loss of crops from frost. So it turns out they put it onto one field. There was an outcry by environmentalists and they convinced a judge to, to tell them to stop and to sterilize the whole field. The excuse at that point was there are weeds that die from frost. And if you put that out there, some of those weeds will survive over the winter and you'll end up with super weeds. That's plausible. But we now know that that Pseudomonas syringae is in the atmosphere, creating rain and snow. What happened? And it gets pushed up there. I live in California now and the wind comes in and pushes against the trees and creates an upward flow and microbes go into the air. What if those microbes that were genetically engineered, displaced the ones that caused rain to occur off the coast from the coast of California. It could change weather patterns here and around the world. So this is an example of the web of life in this unseen kingdoms that we are messing with. And Bear Monsanto has a Monsanto was bought by Bayer. They have a, a, a joint venture with Ginkgo Bioworks, Join Bio. It's going to create nitrogen fixing microbes and put them in the soil. And there's another one. There's Pivot Bio. They already have microbes in 4% of the U.S. corn fields. So we have these big companies putting out quadrillions and quadrillions of microbes. But then you also have students using CRISPR. CRISPR is a way to create a GMO, gene editing. It's also prone to massive side effects. And it's used in all these college biology classes. But it's also used now even in high school. It costs less than $2,000 to buy a lab. Many people are, are doing it in their basements. And the most common organism to use is microbes. Which microbes? Well, you have a choice. You can order from one online store over 10,000 microbes. And then where do you cut the, the microbe along the genome? We're using CRISPR. We'll talk about that. You can buy 120,000 tar targets, crisp, you know, sequences to target. And if those aren't enough, you can make your own, design them online, type it in, it'll be sent to you. If the 10,000 microbes aren't enough, you can go to your local stream or your soil you can pick them up off your body and genetically engineer. Now think about it. What if every biology class in high school and every biology lab in college and all sorts of home hobbyists are now producing genetically engineered microbes that can travel, mutate, swap genes, and damage or collapse ecosystems. You know that some of those people are gonna get it in their hands and they're gonna put it in their mouth. What happens with the oral microbiome? It's one of the most rich and diverse 
microbiomes. There's microbes in there, bacteria, that produce nitric oxide. When we don't have those, and I'm told that using traditional mouthwashes can kill that, hypertension can go up by number of points. Gum disease can increase heart attack risk by 50%. The microbes in the mouth are important. And then, of course, billions get brought down from the mouth through the digestive tract. So right now, we are in a situation of potential devastation. And the Institute for Responsible Technology, which I founded 20 years ago, we're focusing on protecting the microbiome. We want to protect, we want to make responsible regulation on GMOs around the world, but we're starting with the microbiome because it's the most urgent. Because unless it gets turned around, we can make irreversible changes that can affect the health of all living beings and all future generations. And what changes are those? Well, governments around the world are turning a blind eye to GMOs that are created from CRISPR and other gene editing technologies, especially if there's no foreign genes put in. But that doesn't mean that it's not dangerous if there's no foreign genes put in. You could knock out genes, you can create changes. Much of it is unpredictable. And how much do we know about the microbiome? Well, there's about a trillion microbes. We've identified 1%, maybe. So we don't know the majority of what's going and yet we are allowing the biosphere to be flooded, to be flooded with microbes that can destroy or damage the microbes that we don't even understand yet. So the Institute, our Institute has spent many, many years working on GMO food issues. Some of you have questions on that. I'll be happy to answer it in a moment. But now with GMO 2.0, especially the ease of gene editing, we realize we need to pivot our focus. And instead of focusing on consumer education for better choices in the supermarket, which has all this ripple effect, we need to stop governments from allowing gene edited GMOs to be released. And so we want to block the release of all genetically modified microbes. Now, at responsibletechnology.org slash take action right now, we're going to have a number of things in there. So people watching this later, go there, see what the action is of the day. But right now, the USDA happened to put out recently a draft guidance for how you could get a permit to genetically engineer microorganisms. It's a disaster. The USDA looks through blinders and defines what could go wrong in such a narrow way that they'll essentially ignore the, the flood of microbes being produced by academia and the flood of microbes that are being used in facilities as synthetic biology plants to produce things like CBD and drugs and enzymes and whatnot. They'll genetically engineer bacteria or yeast or algae to produce certain proteins, even supplements. And what if those genetically engineered microbes get out? What if the one that's producing the medicine gets out and now it becomes part of your gut bacteria producing the medicine or part of the bacteria in the soil or in the air? This will be avoided by the USDA in its narrow focus. So for those online now, we need some additional names so it's not just IRT submitting it. Please do this today. Even if you have to do it while you're listening, responsibletechnology.org slash take action. Add your name, please, to our comment, which is long. I wouldn't recommend reading the whole comment now while I'm talking because it's like several pages. There's a summary there though. And it talks about some of the things we just did that are being ignored by the USDA. And the comment period ends on May 21st, 2023. We're trying to extend it. 
And we have some other things that we're going to be putting into that take action place too. So we'll let you know when there's another opportunity to let your voice be heard. So I'm going to stop here for a moment. I see three hands up. If anyone else has a question, um, and I'm happy to take questions about the microbes, about GMO 2.0, but really about anything. So Bin Wu, uh, your hand is up. I'm going to unmute you. You've been up for a long time, so you may have forgotten. You may have walked away, so we'll see if you're still there. Okay, Bin Wu, what is your question? Well, you may have walked away. I'm going to mute you again. Rita, I'm going to mute. I'm going to unmute you. So you ready? Here you go. Thank you. I am ready. A question for you. The blueberries have made uh, to the dirty dozen list again. There are so many different brands in the market. So how do you know? Do you think that all the blueberries should, you know? cannot be sprayed with the pesticides probably or should we take the assumption that they all are and just eat only organic blueberries? Thank you, Rita. I'm, I'm muting you again. This is an excellent question. Let's start with the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. This is put out by those excellent people at the um, Environmental Working Group. And what they do is they take U.S. government statistics for residues of agricultural chemicals. And they only look at fruits and vegetables. Now, the U.S. government has been manipulated, to say the least, by Monsanto. Uh, I've documented it for years. They basically, as one person who was formerly at the FDA said, that the regulatory agencies have done everything that big ag, Monsanto, has asked them to do or told them to do. And they told, Monsanto told FDA, oh, you don't have to test for the residues of Roundup. It's safe. You can drink it. It's safer than table salt. Don't drink it. It's a method for suicide in, in Asia. And so it's one of the residues that are not evaluated by the government and they're not showing the impact of residues from Roundup or its chief poison glyphosate in the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. So it's a partial criteria. So if you go to responsibletechnology.org to our homepage, you can go to and and see a list of all the tests that we have been able to accumulate, that we've done, that Moms Across America have done, that your that Environmental Working Group has done, different groups. And you can see which foods have high levels of glyphosate, like oats and wheat and all the beans and legumes and all that. So the first thing you should know, Rita, is that the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen by itself is not sufficient. In addition, EWG has basically turned a blind eye to the dangers of GMOs for a long time. And they had corn and have corn and papaya on the Clean 15, even though both can be genetically engineered. Papaya only if it's from Hawaii and corn unless it says non-GMO or organic. So it's not a perfect system. Now, as far as trying to figure out which blueberries, I'm going to recommend, Rita, that if something is on the dirty dozen, you certainly want to eat the organic version of those or the farmer's market version where you know the farmer. And I wouldn't risk it. Some of those chemicals are very nasty. In fact, I recommend eating organic across the board. There's a film that I did with Amy Hart called Secret Ingredients, where we interview individuals and families that switch to organic. Autistic kids on the spectrum are no longer on the spectrum. Infertile parents, infertile couples now have kids. There's weight problems and brain fog and skin conditions and irritability and, all, and digestive disorders and allergies. And this was in just a small group. But we have 
surveyed 3,256 people who reported getting better from 28 different conditions when they switched to non-GMO and largely organic. And we can show you, maybe we'll do that later today, a bunch of charts showing how the increased use of GMOs in Roundup in the U.S. food supply is paralleled with the increase of about 35 different diseases. So switching to organic is pretty critical for health, Rita. And I would do it with thinking like, well, add some of your medical budget in there. And since you'll be saving the health of the farmer and the environment, add some of your philanthropic do dollars in there. And as you'll see in the film Secret Ingredients, there's uh, which you can rent at secretingredientsfilm.com, that many, many of these people are not going to the doctor and don't have the doctor's bills that they used to. Dramatic reductions far more reduced in doctor's bills than the increase in their food bills. So that's my answer to you, Rita. Um, uh, if, why don't you put your hand down and if you have a follow-up question, we can come back to you. Rochelle Bear, are you ready? Here you go, you're, un, you're um, unmuted, Rochelle. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey, I guess, how do I address you? That's I'm not Jeffrey. Doctor, Jeffrey, no, okay. Don't, don't demote me to a doc, sorry, I'm just. <laughs> okay, um, my question is basically on food. Like when you go into the supermarket, I, I eat all organic, I buy organic, but sometimes I see like a tomato and it's white inside. And I wonder about it being gassed. And- You know, I, I have to stop you right there, Rochelle. I'm, I'm pretty narrow in my focus. Um, I don't, I focus on GMOs, and the chemicals sprayed on GMOs, which is like Roundup, and the new GMOs. So I, I'm afraid I'm not the person to ask about gassing tomatoes. But so if I buy organic, do I know that it's not GMO? I can answer that. Okay. All right, I'm going to put you on mute for a second here. All right, so organics do not allow the intentional use of GMOs. They do not allow the intentional use of glyphosate-based herbicides like Roundup. I use the word intentional. Sometimes there's a contamination. Sometimes it comes in ways that are unavoidable. The US Geological Survey found that glyphosate was in 60 to 100% of the air samples they tested and the rain samples. So if you have glyphosate in the rain, you'll have low levels of glyphosate possibly in your crop because it gets absorbed through the roots, it moves to the food, we eat it. So if you go to responsibletechnology.org and you go to the glyphosate residue database, you will see some organic products will have low levels of glyphosate. The non-organic would typically have much higher levels. It depends on the particular product. Now, Sometimes there's fraud, sometimes there's accidental mixing, but I still think organic is, is a safe way to go. Now with GMOs, if you have a field that's organic and you have a GMO field next to it, you might get some cross contamination. There might be contamination in the seeds that you buy. And so there might be some GMOs in your organic. The non-GMO project, I love them, they require testing if your product has any potential GMOs in it. So if it has you know, corn or soy, cottonseed oil, canola oil, it will require testing. And it needs to be uh, you know, maintaining it below an action threshold of about 0.9% of contamination. And you need to have that level of production in order to get that seal a little butterfly. If you're organic, you don't need testing. It's a process base. It's not a testing based. So you might actually exceed the amount of, of contamination that would be allowable by the non-GMO project, which is why if you see organic and non-GMO project together, that's like the gold standard, unless you're growing yourself or you know your farmer, because then you know it's not allowed to have Roundup. It's not allowed to have GMOs. And if there's any at-risk ingredients, it's been tested. 
Now, if you had to choose between organic and non-GMO project verified, what would you do? I recommend choosing organic because if it's non-GMO project verified, they don't test or concern themselves with Roundup or other toxic chemicals. So you can have oatmeal that's verified non-GMO. Oats are never genetically engineered, not yet. But oats are saturated with Roundup. Now, why would they spray a plant-killing herbicide on oats? They do it three to five days before harvest is what is recommended to dry down the crop. It kills it slowly, but it dries it down so it doesn't mold. It's easier to harvest. It forces rapid ripening, you know, like the plants dying and says, send all the energy to the kids. So all of the extra energy goes to the grain. It forces rapid growth and ripening, and it kills the weeds for next year. So it's used by grain farmers, particularly oats and and wheat. It's used by legumes, so the peas, the mung beans, the chickpeas, etc. It's also sprayed on the vineyard rows, and it goes in through the roots, and so it's in wine. You spray it on the ground in orchards, so it's in orange juice. Um, it's it's pretty pervasive. So the non-GMO project doesn't test for Roundup, but organic is not allowed to use Roundup. So organic would be my first choice. If you can't get organic, at least get non-GMO and avoid those products that have high levels of residues from the list at responsibletechnology.org. So I hope that answers the question. And we're going to go on to David T. Okay, David. Can you hear me? On. Yep, now I can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm on your email list. In fact, it was through you I learned about the death of Ron Cummins from the Organic Consumers Association before I learned it from them directly. That being said, I hope you also correspond with Dr. Zach Bush and also with Ocean Robbins in your campaign and your efforts. Um, but anyway, as to my questions, you had talked about mosquitoes, I believe, in Florida being genetically modified, as I recall. I was curious to know what the status of that was. Also, I think you were the one who talked about how GMO salmon from Canada, I don't know if it was farm-raised or whatever, and whether what the status of that was in terms of interacting with other salmon. And then finally, I was wondering if your organization ever looked at supplements that claim to help the body rid itself of glyphosate. Yes, mosquitoes, supplements, and glyphosate um, elimination. All right. Yeah, I have. Um, let's start with the last one. So I, a lot of people ask me, what can you do besides uh, avoiding GMOs and Roundup? And for years, I would say it's above my pay grade. I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I started speaking to doctors and scientists that were developing protocols. So I created a program called Healing from GMOs and Roundup and interviewed 18 doctors, including Zach Bush um, and Kieran Krishnan and Joe Mercola and, and Dietrich Klinghardt and Lee Cowden and a bunch of others. And um, they each had their own ways to detox. And there are certain products that uh, have, had, have shown some reductions. There's a Purium Biomedic which showed a dramatic reduction in glyphosate in the urine, but it was a very small human sample. So it's hard to draw general conclusions. Zach Bush's um, Ion Biome showed a 20 something percent decrease in glyphosate in the urine. Um, there's a program, there's a product at BiotaQuest that supposedly degrades it, but in a pathway that doesn't produce AMPA, which is the normal degraded version of glyphosate, which is more toxic. Um, there's um, uh, apple cider vinegar has an enzyme in there, which is supposed to break down glyphosate. Um, sauerkraut juice it was fed to cows and it reduced the glyphosate in their urine in a European study. 
a lot of these are in this healing from GMOs and Roundup um, course. And uh, if you sign up for the IRT newsletter, um, we'll announce that the course is currently taken down briefly, but it'll go up very soon um, again for people that would like that. Um, as far as the uh, supplements, uh, no, the, the um, mosquitoes, I want to mute you, David. Um, the Oxitec did this whole big release, second release, with a new generation of mosquitoes and never re reported the results and asked for permission to release even more in Florida and in California. So I don't have the current up-to-date status whether it's actually been released in California, but they did get approval by the feds and now they need approval on a county by county basis in California. So it's, it's disastrous. So I was talking to um, a person who works for Oxitec, uh, Eric, Derek Nemo, who was a senior scientist there. And we were both in the Florida Keys in 2014 testifying to the Mosquito Control Board, trying to get them, I was trying to get them to not approve the mosquito, and he was trying to get them to approve the mosquito. But he and I talked during the lobby, and I, first of all, I said to him, you're, you're changing the genome permanently, and you shouldn't be doing this, it's very dangerous. And he goes, oh, no, 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 they won't survive in the, in the, in the uh, environment. Um, under normal circumstances, they said their survival rate, they originally said they'd all die. They were lying. They knew they were lying, but they lied. They lied a lot. And they will find, oh yeah, maybe 3% will survive. Well, that's a lot if you're releasing a billion mosquitoes. But in the presence of, of an antibiotic, then um, tetracycline, then it survives because that's used as part of the process to keep some alive so that they can mate. So in the, in the presence of tetracycline, which is found in cat food, it's found in, in rivers, et cetera, et cetera, the survival rate can go up to 18%. So I was explained to him that it's impossible to, to make that guarantee that you're not gonna change the gene pool, but he was sure of it. Well, they released millions upon millions, probably billions of mosquitoes in Brazil. And three years later, uh, some researchers went there independently and found in fact, that there was a completely new type of mosquito that had never been part of the gene pool that had genes from the genetically engineered mosquitoes and genes from the natural mosquitoes. And they didn't know whether it was more dangerous or less dangerous, whether it was harder to kill or easier to kill. The reason why they were genetically engineering mosquitoes was to reduce the population of the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which carries Zika and dengue fever and chikungunya, uh, which is another disease. And they released it in five countries now. And there's absolutely no evidence that it works. In fact, where they've done tests in the, of the population, there hasn't been a reduction. Now, it's interesting that they want to release it in California to reduce the incidence of these diseases. In the last five or 10 years, there hasn't been a single California-born disease from these mosquitoes. There's been a few hundred from people that got, got it in another state and came back, but it, the, the problem doesn't exist here. And yet they're going to risk the population. How are they going to risk the population? Or well, I asked Derek Nemo, I said, Derek, have you tested the saliva of the biting female mosquitoes that you're creating? Because he told us that you know, there'll be no female mosquitoes created, but they turns out there was plenty of female mosquitoes. They're the ones that bite. And they finally acknowledged that. Another one of their lies that they had to admit was not true. And I asked him, have you ever tested the saliva? Because the saliva gets into our bloodstream. And I'll never forget his answer. Well, he, he, he said, first of all, we're, we're just now testing to see if the protein that's produced by the inserted gene is expressed in the saliva because they put a gene in it produces a protein kills off offspring makes them sterile and they were they were going to see if that protein ended up 
inside human blood to see if it was in the saliva. I said, Derek, the process of genetic engineering creates massive collateral damage in the genome. In a human cell, when they added one gene, up to 5% of the functioning genes changed their levels of expression. Some were shut off, some were turned on, others got more or less proteins than they were plant than they were producing before. Shouldn't you be testing the entire composition of the saliva and not just for one protein? He said, good idea. <laughs> so this, they had already released millions in four countries by the time I was speaking with him. So these people should not be in charge of the gene pool, which brings us back to GMO 2.0, where we're giving CRISPR kits to virtually anyone who can create virtually anything, and there's no requirement for testing for most of the, of the gene edited GMOs, so you can create your own insects, you can create your own grasses and trees and animals and fish that glow in the dark and microbes, unless we stop this irresponsible deregulation. Now, you also asked about salmon. Um, there's salmon that have genes from a different salmon and an arctic eel uh, that cause it to produce growth hormones throughout the year. Normally, it's just for six months or so. Uh, but And then they have a resting period. But these are like always growing, growing, growing. And they grow very quickly. And so they get to market earlier. And when this Oxitec did studies to prove it was safe, they were ridiculous studies using like six fish. So few that the statistical significance, even when there was a 50% increase or a 25% increase in either the allergenicity or a cancer promoting hormone, it wasn't statistically significant. So I think the stuff may be very dangerous, but we can't verify, and yet they have approval to make it and sell it in the United States. Now, there's a similar salmon that was created by Canadian researchers, and they were genetically engineered to go faster, to grow faster. And they were put into tanks with other frankenfish or with natural fish. And when they had enough food, everything was fine. When they reduced the food, then the frankenfish freaked because they're growing so fast, they're voraciously hungry and they became aggressive and they killed and ate and destroyed the other fish in the tank. So they had um, population crashes or total extinctions in the tanks. So if these fish get out in the ocean, they could they have a horrible influence. So I don't know if the, I think there's some genetically engineered salmon that have been released in the United States already. It's unlabeled because it goes out through restaurants and catering organizations. And there's been some also like that in Canada, but um, it hasn't been large production yet. Okay, Anatina. Hi, Jeffrey. Thank you for all the uh, important information you work on finding for us. Um, question. Uh, what is the mechanism by which glyphosate affects humans and other living creatures? That's like, it's kind of like you set me up for that, Anadina. I'm sorry. It's like you set me up for that. It was like, I have the answer. I good, have it good. all. I, I actually have it in um, a PowerPoint. Um, let's see. Um, all right. So I'm going to share my share a PowerPoint here in just a second. Oh, I can't do it that way. Now I can't see you. <laughs> All right, I'll just tell you. So glyphosate, um, it was originally patented as a descaler of minerals in industrial boilers and pipes. Because one of the things that it does is it's a chelator. It grabs onto minerals. So it just grabbed onto the extra mineral buildup and pulled it off. And then when they spread the, the glyphosate 
that had done its job on the ground, it killed all the plants, so Monsanto bought the molecule and patented it as an herbicide. Now, because it deletes minerals, it means that when we take some, it makes certain minerals unavailable. And minerals are cofactors in the biochemical pathways in our body. So they're like the foreman that has to show up to start the workers to work. Otherwise, they just sit around on strike or they just wait. So you have all these biochemical pathways waiting for the manganese or waiting for the, the cobalt or whatever. And if they're, if they're not available, then it causes massive problems with many, many things. Um, and that's one, one of the things that glyphosate does. It also damages the microvilli along the gut and suppresses digestive enzymes. It's toxic to the mitochondria. My friend Zach Bush said he can look through a microscope and see the mitochondria get destroyed when he adds glyphosate to the cell. Glyph mitochondria is related to aging, energy, cancer, and overall health. So when you're destroying the mitochondria, a lot of things are, are, get worse. It promotes birth defects. It's what's called a teratogen. Um, and also causes premature, tends to create premature um, births, lower birth weights, and uh, higher uh, birth defects. It's an endocrine disruptor, and particularly it damages the aromatase, which is what creates the balance between estrogen and testosterone. It disrupts the, de the purification or detoxification in our bodies in a couple of ways. One, there's, there's the detoxification enzymes in the, in the liver. It's called the cytochrome P450 enzymes, and they get damaged, and so there's less detoxification that way. And there's also something called NRF2, um, which is reduced by about 30% in studies from friends of mine in Mara Labs. And that shows a, um, that our cells, both in the liver and elsewhere, can't detox. And by the way, Mara Labs has broccoli, which also uh, can help guard against the reduction of the NRF2. And they also have found that intercellular communication, which is gap junctions, is reduced by glyphosate by about 50%, and their broccoli also protects against that. Glyphosate also causes oxidative stress and genotoxicity, which is linked to cancer. The gap junction damage is also linked to cancer. And so it's a called a class 2A carcinogen by the World Health Organization. It also infiltra infiltrates the brain and creates infl inflammation, which can lead to potentially Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative disorders. It blocks the shikimate pathway of gut bacteria, which, as I said earlier, produces the L-tryptophan and the tyrosine, which in turn produce the serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine. And it also... Um, is an antibiotic, which kills off the beneficial bacteria, but not the nasty stuff, and it creates leaky gut. And the, the antibacterial and the leaky gut and the mitochondrial issues, they can, you can just line up most diseases behind those, um, because most diseases are related to one or more of those three things. So it's really nasty. Um, there's other theories about it um, in terms of glycine substitution. I'm not going to go into that. It's a little technical and not yet proven, but it's very, very dangerous for many things. And if you look at the percentage or the amount of glyphosate sprayed on soy and corn in the U.S., there's about 38 charts I have of different diseases that rise in parallel. All right, so your hand is still up, David, and your hand is still up, Anatina. And I'm going to first unmute Anatina in case you have a follow-up. The uh, creatures that get affected by glyphosate. What was that? The other creatures that get affected by glyphosate. Yeah, there's. We have a. Okay, everybody. Uh, we have a citation list on our website. Okay. There's all sorts of them. And Thank you. Yeah, yeah, a lot of them. Actually, I have uh, Bin Wu. Finally, we get to hear from you. Okay, Thank Bin you Wu. Very much. Yeah, you agree the talk. And um, do we need to take the um, probiotic to maintain the health? Okay, I will put you on mute and answer that. Do we need to take a probiotic in order to maintain health? It's interesting, you know, 
I'm not an expert, but I'll tell you what experts have told me. Uh, Kieran Krishnan has a probiotic. You can get it as a, as a consumer through Just Thrive. Uh, somewhere on our website, we have a discount. <laughs> Sorry, I'll have to find it. Um, and that helps create increased biodiversity. It helps promote the keystone strains that have a lot of different influence on the gut bacteria. And he's done dozens of clinical trials and peer-reviewed laboratory uh, work showing that his probiotics, spore-based probiotics, actually uh, protect against um, glyphosate and also help counteract certain diseases. Um, Zach Bush talks about just breathing in different territories. You breathe by the ocean, you breathe in the in the mountains, and you bring and you bring in microbes. He's against taking specific probiotics that the whole purpose is to multiply those probiotics because he says it'll be like a monoculture. Although um, Kieran Krishnan's just thrive, it produces actually diversity. So it doesn't quite work in that same model that Zach was talking about. There's also um, taking fermented vegetables, which have a huge variety. They also have prebiotics. A lot of the root vegetables have prebiotics, which feed the, the probiotics. So if you have a lot of variety of, of fermented vegetables, you'll get a lot of variety of the probiotics. And variety is one of the, one of the most important aspects of a healthy gut microbiome. And it's one of the characteristics of the more early human beings who were frozen in some bog or, or, or permafrost. They have more and they have more diversity. And then um, uh, there's also uh, some of these probiotics that we talked about that are designed for reducing stress and all these things. Um, the ion biome that, that Zach Bush has is supposed to create an environment to foster more intercellular communication between the microbes and, and whatnot. So there's a lot of expert opinions and Ben, I'm just telling you what I hear. Um, and I, I've tried them all and I've interviewed each one of these formulators and scientists and doctors so that they can provide the evidence. So if you sign up for our, the, at the Institute for Responsible Technology, at responsibletechnology.org. Next time I do an interview, you'll be able to hear that directly. All right, so um, Steve, you haven't had a chance yet. Hi, um, thank you. I keep switching my hand on and off because I don't know. Um, after a, this seems to be a common thread. After a lifetime, of the insults that, that, that you describe, what could you do? If you've had surgeries and you've been on long courses of antibiotics, maybe you were a premature delivery or, and you didn't, or you weren't, or you were from an era before breastfeeding when breastfeeding was frowned upon and you didn't, and you weren't inoculated. A lot of these experts say that the microbiome is like real estate. You know, you, you have to get it, while the getting is good and all of this stuff of taking stuff now just doesn't, doesn't, except for kefir, but you know, that all the other stuff sort of supports the microbiome, but you're not really going to create the different, uh, you know, change the environment much, except for the fecal transplants. And those aren't really available to us. So Jeffrey, what's a body to do? That's a good question, Steve. And you're a great, you're, you're, you really set it up very well. Uh, first of all, I think we all know of some of these people that are like 95 years old and they're smoking or they're just eating junk food or they don't eat any vegetables or the, the human body is amazing and the repair mechanisms are built in. So there's detox, rebuild and repair. It's part of who we are. It's how we grow as a bait from a baby to an adult. And many of those mechanisms are there to repair. But it's not just in humans, you know, they took mice and they put, gave them genetically engineered uh, Roundup Ready crops for soybeans for eight months and they had damage to their testicles, pancreas, and, and um, I think it was the heart. And 
um, or liver. And when they put the next group on non-GMO soy for the next month, it started to reverse. Uh, when Kiran Krishnan took uh, fecal matter from a three-year-old from um, Sweden who had lived far away from the city, never taken antibiotics, never gotten vaccinated, always eaten organic food, so she was a unicorn, they, they took that fecal matter, or gut bacteria and whatnot, and put it into something called the Scheim model in, in Belgium, where it looks like it's basically a fake human gut and they fed it food for some time, two or three weeks, and then they put in Roundup. And there was these dramatic changes. And the changes were, were like, um, they were so bad that I went through these 28 different conditions that people reported getting better from when they switched to non-GMO and organic food. And I said to Kieran, would the changes in the gut bacteria that you saw explain any of these conditions. And we went through digestive problems, fatigue, obesity, brain fog, anxiety, depression, allergies, concentration and memory, joint pain, seasonal allergies, gluten sensitivity, insomnia, eczema and skin conditions, hormonal problems, musculoskeletal pain, musculoskeletal pain, autoimmune disease, etc. And he said, yes, we explain the mechanism in each case, in this one interview, of how the changes in the gut bacteria could create those particular diseases or make them worse. But then he put in his spores and it started to reverse. He had to stop at a certain point before he would want to because there's only a limited amount of time you can use this model for and it breaks down. But actually it was reversing. And we know from human clinical trials, he actually showed reversals of specific diseases from the probiotics. So it's not, you see, one thing, Steve, is we sometimes hear the doom and gloom, you can't make a change from conventional science and conventional medicine. Oh, once you have it in the, you know, as a child, it's stuck for life, or you'll never be able to get out of diabetes, you know, type two diabetes or whatever. When you look at at some of the functional medicine, environmental medicine, integrative medicine, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, homeopathy, you look outside the realm of the traditional or non-traditional, the conventional chemical-based pharmaceutical method, then a lot of things turn out to be more flexible than we were told. So I can say that based on the research that I've looked at, and it's not my area, so I'm not exhaustive, but the ones that I have looked at, it is absolutely possible to rebuild, repair, uh, repopulate. And some of these folks have specific um, microbes just for those that have taken uh, long, long antibiotics. So there's good news there. And uh, I, I know that from my experience, um, when I talked to and like surveyed uh, people at 150 lectures and I said, what did you get better from? when you switch to a non gmo organic diet from the 3,256 people that filled out the same survey. Most of those people did not do anything in addition to, at the time, switching to a better diet, and they got better from the diseases and substantially better. So that's good news. Okay, so David, Stephen, Ben Wu, you still have your hands up. Um, I'm going to go to David. David Hi. You... Yep. Hi. Um, quick question. First of all, have you heard anything about being able to detox the glyphosate using infrared sauna? Secondly, are you familiar with um, the efforts here in Tacoma Park, Maryland, where they were able to ban glyphosate on lawn care and how you may want to use that as model law? For other areas of the country, if not, um, you may want to look into that. It's also the county government itself banned glyphosate from lawn care. And then finally, I was wondering if you all considered or are working with environmental groups like NRDC or Sierra Club. So it was banned glyphosate, NRDC, and the first one was what? The infrared sauna. Infrared, okay. So in the healing from GMOs and Roundup, I did actually... Um, here from Lee Cowden 
and Dietrich Klinghart. They both suggested an infrared sauna uh, as a part of the detox. And they had different protocols and they weren't always the exact same, but yes. Um, and NRDC and Sierra Club, I was on the Sierra Club G Genetic Engineering Committee um, more than a decade ago for a number of years, but GMOs have not been much in their focus. And I don't think NRDC has been focused on them at all. Most of the major uh, nonprofits just don't look at GMOs. So, I'm surprised um, because it affects the animals in particular with NRDC. They would, you may want to approach NRDC and see if they might help you or work with you. They've done it with other organizations. Thank you. I know WWF, um, they're not necessarily against GMOs. In fact, they had the round table on sustainable soy and um, they allowed GMO soy to be considered sustainable. And I sat with someone there in DC and they were, they came out, you know, they're not convinced that GMOs are a problem. And I was willing to give them all sorts of science and may have at the time, but you know, some people don't really want to be convinced. Um, at rounduprisks.com, which is one of our websites, we explain how people have gotten together to ban glyphosate in their cities or counties. Beyond Pesticides has done that. Moms Across America has done that. Toxin-free uh, cities have done that. Um, it's, a, it's something that's happened in dozens and dozens of places now. And the results are when they, ha when they have the proper alternative to glyphosate, it actually can save them money and the lawns look better and all that because they build up the biology of the soil and they don't destroy the microbiome. Roundup kills the microbiome, not just in the gut, but also in the soil. And uh, it's not a good thing for the environment. Okay, Bin Wu, you still have your hand up. Yeah. You some... Go ahead. I have one question. Thank you very much for the great talk today. And um, usually how many male um, should people eat to decrease the disease? Is it three days? One day is three meal or just two meal and uh, just one meal? How many meals does it take to decrease the disease? You know, it's interesting. Um, I was traveling and speaking about GMOs for many, many years. And people would come up to me and say, I can tell when I eat a GMO. And I'm a little embarrassed to say that I didn't believe them because I was expecting it to be like just slight changes in st statistics of disease that we would see over time. I wasn't expecting it to be something that was so overt. And I, was, I, started, I started speaking on GMOs in 1996 and writing about it. And then um, 20 years later, um, or 10 years later, in 2006, I started speaking to the medical community. And um, for the American Association of Environmental Medicine, I was going back each year because they would focus on a different disease each year. And I'd say all the information about GMOs and inflammation and allergies and cancer and this. So I would, I would pull all the research together and speak about it so they all knew the, the risks of of GMOs uh, for that particular disease. And I didn't realize it, but these doctors were starting to prescribe non-GMO diets to their patients. So I went back in 2009 with a video camera and I interviewed them and they were talking to me, he said, yeah, people are getting better. Uh, and you know, an allergist said, my patients will react more to GMOs than to non-GMOs. And um, Emily Widner, Widner uh, doctor from, from, from uh, Chicago, said to me, I put all my patients on a non-GMO diet, you all get better. And I'm like, what percentage? She says, I told you all, all right, 98%. I said, how many patients have you put on a non-GMO diet? She took about a minute and she was thinking, I was watching her thinking, and she said, 5,000. <laughs> I was like, whoa. So I said, can I go to your office and interview some of the patients? She said, sure. And I've talked to one doctor who had 9,000 patients. So I know Emily, I asked Emily, what's the typical um, improvement. She says, well, you put them on a new diet and anxiety and depression can get better right away. A asthma and allergies, three to seven days. Digestive disorders, it may take up to two months, but then you may have to rebuild it over two years. So that was her experience. But I looked at her protocol and she was putting people not only on organic food, 
but she was reducing the processed food, so they were using more ingredients. So it's hard to determine whether it was the GMO or the Roundup or the processed and the other stuff. But at the same time, I was going to some farmers and saying, and they were putting their pigs and their cows on non-GMO feed. And very soon they were seeing a change. One pig farmer, within three days, he saw changes that the pigs were acting like they did 14 years ago before they started feeding them GMO-based feed. And they were active and, and, and energetic instead of just lying down all the time. He had to constantly during those 14 years inject them because they were always getting diseases. Um, they, they were a mess. And he didn't think it was the GMOs, but as soon as he put them on non-GMO diet, they started getting better. There's another uh, pig farmer from Denmark. He said he put, he put his pigs on non-GMO soy. Two days later, the farm hand came up to him and said, you changed the feed. He said, uh-oh, what happened? He said, no more diarrhea. In two days, they had before that they had diarrhea that was so bad, they could kill a lot of the a lot of the piglets. They couldn't figure out how to get rid of it. It was the soy. Now, some people are more sensitive than others. Um, there's a family that had their own chickens. They had eggs every day. One day, the mother and the daughter had anaphylactic uh, allergic reactions and were rushed to the hospital. The father called the feed um, supplier said, did you change the feed of the chickens? And he said, yeah, couldn't get any non-GMO, so I gave you conventional. And it just took, you know, that one experience. Um, so some people are very sensitive. And at the movie Secret Ingredients, there's some doctors that, that tell about patients that switch to organic and their autoimmune disease symptoms go away or their joint pain goes away. And then they cheat on their diet. Sometimes it's one, one meal, sometimes it's a weekend, sometimes they just get off the diet and the symptoms return. So the answer actually, Bin Wu, is it depends. Some people are more sensitive. Some people are completely insensitive. They're not gonna tell the difference whether they're with it, organic or not. And we don't know whether it's actually causing problems, but they're not noticing anything. So it's too hard to pinpoint. All right, I'm going to resume my talk. And then if there's more, questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And this is about gene editing. What is it? How does it work? And why is it not ready for prime time? Okay, so let me pull up my script here. On the, on the website, there's a film called Seven Reasons Why Gene Editing is Dangerous and Unpredictable. And I have the script for that six minute animated film, and I'm gonna go through the seven reasons. But first, let's talk about what CRISPR does. CRISPR is a type of gene editing. And what makes it, what sets it apart is it's really inexpensive and it doesn't require a lot of training. CRISPR gives the keys to the kingdoms to virtually anyone. So you have, these chemicals that cut the DNA, these molecules, little molecular scissors. You have other molecules that have a specific sequence that looks to match the sequence in the genome. And when it matches it, the scissors cuts it. And then the repair mechanisms in the cell will reconnect the genome. And sometimes you'll put in a little template so it'll rebuild it according to a particular formula. Sometimes you will stick a whole nother large gene there so it'll stick that in there. But the purpose is either you cut it to, to damage something, like to knock out a gene, or to rebuild it in a certain way, or to insert something new. And the, what happens is when people use CRISPR, they don't necessarily check to see how successful or how unsuccessful the gene editing was. There's a few people who've done research on the reliability of CRISPR, and it turns out it's a disaster. There was a, an article in the journal Nature where they summarized the results of three CRISPR uh, studies on human 
embryos and described it as chromosomal mayhem. So here's what can go wrong. First of all, there's a lot of different sequences up and down the genome. We've got 2 billion in the human genome. And when it's searching for the right sequence, it might cause changes or cuts all over the, the genome. So those are called off-target effects, cutting in the wrong place. And then when the repair occurs, it's not always easy. I mean, it's not always predictable. The, the cell will throw a bunch of things at it, take pieces of DNA nearby, and it can cause deletions, and it can cause additions and mutations. It can even cause something called chromothripsis, where it's a shattering of the chromosome, which then reforms in a more random order, causing massive damage. So this sloppy repair can cause all sorts of mutations in the DNA. And then the third point is that it'll pick up genes from the Petri dish that, you're wor that it's working in and add it into the genome. So if there's some bacterial genes that were used to deliver the CRISPR mechanics, they can get incorporated. If there's, you know, sometimes the serum in the Petri dish comes from goats or cows, they have some extra DNA in there, they'll get pushed in there. So there's mice that have ended up with goats and cow DNA. There's cows that have ended up with bacterial DNA. So it's mixing genes in ways that you can't predict. Now also, when they knock out a gene, I'll give you an example. There's a company that wanted to sell mushrooms that would not turn brown when sliced. So they knocked out the gene that produced the protein that had the browning impact. And they, because the US is one of those countries that have essentially deregulated CRISPR when there's no foreign DNA, the USDA received a letter from this company and said, we don't need to regulate you. So they're ready to put the mushrooms on the market. Two or three, two or three years later, someone did research on CRISPR's knocking out mechanism and found out it failed one third of the time. But in some of the times that it fails, it's a partial knockout. And the gene creates not the normal protein, but a truncated protein, because part of the code is missing or mutated. So it creates a different protein than the original organism. And when it's a truncated protein, it might be toxic or allergenic. So here was a mushroom that was approved for human consumption in the United States and never tested for truncated proteins that could be damaging. Also, when you insert the genetic mechanism for the scissors and the guide, that causes something called insertion mutation, can cause damage up and down the DNA. Once you've made the change, then you clone the plant into a, you know, clone the cells into a plant, and that creates its own mutations, hundreds or thousands of them. And then when you've made changes in the genome, you sometimes change the way the genes express. It's called epigenetics. There's changes in some of the material surrounding the genome, which can cause it to express or not. So they found that when they genetically engineered mice with CRISPR, there was a change that lasted for 10 generations, and that's when they stopped testing. So it might have been permanent for all future generations. So these are seven reasons why gene editing is dangerous and unpredictable. And yet, the biotech industry, in a very well-funded and orchestrated campaign, has convinced the governments of the United States, the UK, Australia, Japan, uh, Brazil, Argentina, India, to ignore gene editing and say, anyone can do it and release them in the food, 
release them in the environment as long as there's no foreign DNA inserted. And this, this is like, to give you an idea of what this means, when you release a GMO, you cannot recall it. You're making changes that you cannot predict. You're creating organisms whose activities and interactions you cannot predict and you cannot recall. It's not being properly regulated and you're giving everyone the opportunity to do it. Incrementally, unless we stop it, we will be changing the gene pool, incrementally replacing nature, incrementally ending biological evolution as we know it. So next generation and all future generations may not inherit the products of the billions of years of evolution. Instead, they may inherit the mix of natural products and lab-made products from a technology prone to side effects. So we have arrived at this inevitable time in human civilization where we can redirect the streams of evolution and where GMO really means God move over more than any time in its history. So we have some decisions to make. So the Institute for Responsible Technology is convening the world to make those decisions rather than simply allowing the Monsantos of the world to do that. And I'd like to encourage you to make a donation to IRT. ResponsibleTechnology.org is our website. If you put a slash take action, you can also add your name to our current action step. And right now it's it's a, a comment period to the USDA that ends soon. But we actually have been massively successful in the past educating consumers about the health dangers of genetically engineered foods by building a movement. I traveled to 45 countries and trained 1,500 people and released two books and five movies and put out articles. The Institute for Responsible Technology has been pioneering the messaging that helped build the movement that now can boast half the world's population understanding that GMO foods are unsafe. When I started, no other NGO wanted to talk about the health dangers. I was thinking, you guys are crazy. If they were talking about the health dangers, I would never have started this because I felt like that's the Achilles heel of Monsanto. That needs to be conveyed to consumers and no one wanted to do it. So, oh, okay, I'll do it for a little while and I have been doing it ever since. So we built a movement, we know it's possible, and now we're building a new movement to cause responsible regulation of gene editing. And we're starting first immediately with microbes because they can take us down pretty fast. If you genetically engineer a cow, it takes a year before they have the offspring, right? If you genetically engineer bacteria, within that year, it's all over the planet if it's a fast replicator and it gets, it gets in the wind. So it's a pretty urgent situation. And so I'd like to encourage you to make a donation to the Institute and ideally a recurring one. So we know it's coming each month so we can then hire the staff and invest in assets that we need. Because when we were doing consumer education alone, it was relatively less expensive by a long shot. Now we have to create national laws and international treaties, not just in the United States and not just in most countries. You release a genetically engineered microbes continually by the millions in another country because it doesn't have the laws. It's going to get to our country. If they're creating genetically engineered gene edited foods and shipping them without labeling, it'll get into our country. It's a global situation. So that's why I'd like to recommend uh, donating so that you can be part of this team. Because right now, human civilization needs leaders to say, okay, I'm stepping up. I'll be a nature whisperer. I'll be a microbiome whisperer. I will take the steps needed to protect and safeguard nature now. Otherwise, all future generations might be having to struggle with what this generation left behind. So let's take some more questions. Please raise your hand. Okay, Rochelle, you're unmuted. Hi, 
Um, thank you, first of all, for all this information. It was so eye-opening. I learned so much from listening to you for the last hour. So I appreciate you. Um, my question, I have two questions. One is that my neighbors use Roundup, the gardeners use Roundup, and I'm concerned if I'm breathing that in, um, if that's dangerous to me, and if I'm breathing it in just from being outside. Um, my other question was when you were talking about genetic um, you know, uh, engineering, um, in humans, isn't there a benefit in the sense if somebody has, if, if you know this child's gonna have a disease, and you could engineer that, that the child doesn't get the disease? I, I love these questions, Rochelle. Thank you, I'm gonna mute you yeah. again. Um, so I'm not against the use of genetic engineering on human, for human gene therapy in a non-inheritable way. So if you genetically engineer like the eggs or the sperm cells, then that can be passed on to future generations and future generations, and we can change the nature of nature of human beings. And I'm not in favor of that. I think that's an irresponsible use of the technology. But there's something called somatic cell, or, um, and that means that you're making a change just to that individual. So that if you make a change, let's say they have a defective gene, and you can go in there and you can fix that defective gene and they're willing to take the risk. So it's informed consent and the procedure may save their life. I think that's fine. But human genetic engineers know that the technology is prone to side effects. There have been human genetic engineering trials that have resulted in deaths where people got leukemia, a cancer gene got, got uh, turned on. So when human gene therapy, and I'm very good friends with one, with a, with a researcher in human gene therapy, um, they spend a lot of time looking at the details of what's, what they're doing, if it worked, if it didn't work. But with agricultural genetic engineering, they don't even look. It's, it's pretty shocking when you realize they never test the sequence of the proteins. So the proteins may be different than intended. They don't check the sequence of the genome right around the, the insertion or the rest of the genome. There could be massive changes. They don't check all the different RNA strands, all the different proteins that are created, all the different metabolites. If they did, it's a little scary. Roundup ready corn compar compared to regular corn of the same type, had about 200 changes in the protein and metabolites, which comes from the collateral damage. Two things that were increased in the Roundup Ready corn, I love these names, putrescine and cadaverine. Putrid and cadaver, they are responsible for the foul odor of rotting dead bodies. They're also linked to cancer and allergies, and they were in higher levels in Roundup Ready corn. The corn that produces its own insecticide, Monsanto's BT corn, it had a gene that was normally silent in corn, switched on and it produces gamazine, which is a known allergen. So it turns out that in the agricultural scenarios, they're using this technology in a very dangerous way. If they used it for human gene therapy and it's one person's life, and it's informed consent, I have no problem with it. So I'm glad you brought that up because I'm not against genetic engineering full stop. It's whether it's being used responsibly. So if your neighbor is using Roundup, then get a copy of um, Secret Ingredients. You can rent it at secretingredientsfilm.com. We're having some trouble with the website, so we're, I think you'll probably be able to get in there now. And you'll, you'll see in there, it convinces virtually everyone, first of all, to be more organic um, because it shows what happens before, but it goes into the details of how bad Roundup is. And so you want to get that, you want to save their lives. But yeah, it's possible it gets in the air because it's in the air, you know, 60 to 60 to 100% of the air samples 
by the U.S. Geological Survey. But, you know, it depends on the, it generally will land and, and stay there. Things like dicamba will revolatilize and move miles, and that's a problem. But Roundup is more stable, but it'll also stay in the ground, possibly for a very long time. Um, it breaks down depending on the, on the organic matter and the pH and the enzymes or the bacteria in the soil. The longest recorded half-life, which is the amount of time it takes to reduce the glyphosate by half, the longest recorded half-life was 22 years, but usually within a year or two, it's degraded. Um, but it can also, in the presence of certain chemicals, reactivate and reseparate and become dangerous again. And of course, animals, dogs, cats, they can roll in it. Then you pet them, and the kids pet them, and the kids put their hands in their mouth. And the dogs may get cancer. So dogs used to not have cancer very often. Very rare. Wasn't even taught in the veterinary uh, training of, of Barbara Royal, uh, uh, who's Oprah Winfrey's veterinarian. She told me, now all these dogs have cancer. It turns out one out of every 1.6 dogs have cancer. We think it's the Roundup, not just in the food, but also on the ground with their rolling around. So uh, yeah, I would say if your neighbor's doing it, it's probably not airborne all the time. You don't want to be outside while they're spraying. So at the very least, Rochelle, if they're not willing to watch the film, if they're not willing to make a change, and they're, you can go to Beyond Pesticides and they, you can use vinegar and you can use steam and you can use boiling water and all these other things that are safer. And you can tell them about the Roundup trial where all these people used Roundup and got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and 125,000 plaintiffs got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But there's so many more other people that have other cancers probably because of Roundup. So if they're not willing to, to change their habit, then you could say, I would like to close my doors and, and uh, not go outside while you're spraying. And um, can you make sure you don't do it while it's windy? So that's the best I can offer, Rochelle. You're Thank on you mute. So you're, yeah, OK. All right, anyone else? Stephen Shore, you got a question? Uh, this is Michael. Actually, I've, I've got a question for you. What What do you mean by um, What do you mean by the phrase GMO 2.0 as opposed to the previous versions of, of GMO? Well, in the old days, to genetically engineer the corn and the soy, you'd have two different methods. Uh, a popular method was a gene gun where you take a gun, they originally used 22 calibers, but it got a little more fancy, and you take little particles of gold or tungsten, and you coat it with little gene constructs. So there's million, millions of them. You shoot that gun into a plate of cells, vast number of cells, hoping that some of those genes get into the, cell, the, D, the nucleus and then get incorporated into the DNA. And then you clone it and you see if it worked. But the process of the gene gun causes damage and you don't know where in the genome it goes in. Or you put it in um, bacterium, um, which is designed normally to smuggle genes into plants. And it smuggles in like tumor creating genes. They take out the tumor creating genes, they put in the gene they want, they put that smuggler into a petri dish of cells and it will smuggle in the genes and that also is creates massive collateral damage and you don't know where in the genome you're going to end up with the the new gene gene editing is one of the 2.0 technologies and that is specific where they target a particular place in the genome because of this guide and scissors and that's, it, it's a, it still has the massive collateral damage. It still changes the sequence. And there's something I want to speak about sequence in just a moment. Um, but uh, it, let me just make a note here because I want to talk about Ayurveda and, and GMOs. 
which is really fun. Another GMO 2.0 is something called gene drives, where normally when, when the mother and father uh, mate and give, give birth, uh, there's half the genes from the mom and half the genes from the dad. So if there's a GMO and a non-GMO and they mate, then half the offspring it will get that. And then half that, that half will then mate with non-GMO and then half of those offspring. So it dilutes over time. Gene drives are a mechanism where you put the genetic engineering mechanism into the genome and it replicates the trait and it puts it on the other chromosome. And every offspring gets the trait. So it's a way of changing the nature of nature very quickly. And they want to use this to wipe out mosquitoes and wipe out rats and whatnot. And this is very dangerous because the mechanism might end up being transferred to another um, organism or it might um, change the, the whole ecology in ways that you don't know. So that's another GMO 2.0 technology. There's also RNA, where RNA turns out to be very important because it has an effect on gene expression. So if we eat a plant, we, don't, we not only get the vitamins and the minerals and the phytonutrients, we get some of the plant's RNA. And that actually can cause some of our genes to express more protein or less protein. In other words, it reprograms our gene expression, which is very interesting. Now I'm going to talk about Ayurveda because it's related to this. Ayurveda talks about herbs in a very interesting way. That there's a sequence of the laws of nature. All the laws of nature are in humans. And they have a sequence that's appropriate to create health. And that when there's something outside of health, when there's ill health or disease, it's like the sequence has become mal-expressed. It's not expressing correctly. So you take an herb that has been created with the same laws of nature as the area in your body that is now out of sequence. So let's say you have a problem with your ear. You get the herb that has been made with the similar laws of nature. You take the herb and there's a resonance effect and it resets the laws of nature to fix the ear. So it's a very interesting concept of like resonance. Like you think in terms of tuning forks. But if you know about RNA, it turns out this ancient explanation has a scientific basis. There is a sequence in the herbs and it's the DNA and the DNA produces the RNA. And the RNA, when we eat the herb, can reset the genetic expression of our DNA. So in that sense, we're taking in intelligence. It says the food is intelligence and conveys intelligence into the body. And this is a way that we can interpret this ancient knowledge um, with modern understanding. So now let's think what happens when you change the genetic sequence and you're producing RNA and its proteins that are not natural, are they reprogramming our gene expression in a way that's off? So instead of giving health, it gives disease. This is one way, this is one of the ways that GMOs might be leaving a lasting impression. But it's also true that when we eat genetically engineered food, it has genes inserted into the DNA. And in the only human feeding study ever conducted on the genetically engineered foods that we're eating, they confirmed that part of that inserted gene, this was in Roundup Ready Soybeans, transferred and incorporated into the DNA of bacteria living inside us. That means we may be colonizing our gut bacteria every time we eat genetically engineered food. Now, this was funded by the UK government, which was very pro-GMO, still is. So as soon as they found out that it happened, they stopped the funding of the research. So we don't know 
if the gene that had transferred into the DNA was producing proteins. Now imagine this, Bt corn. Corn is designed to produce an insecticide that kills insects by poking holes in their guts. We eat the Bt corn. We know that that same Bt causes allergic reactions in humans, creates more sensitivity for allergic reactions to other products, and in high concentrations in a laboratory, pokes the same type of holes in human cells. What if the gene that produces the Bt toxin transfers to the DNA of our gut bacteria and continues to function? It might turn our intestinal flora into living pesticide factories, producing Bt over and over again, which might drill holes in our gut walls, creating leaky gut. And then the Bt can get in there. And the Bt may be dangerous to other things inside the system. Well, it turns out 93% of the pregnant women tested in Canada had Bt toxin in their blood, 80% in their unborn fetuses. How did they have so much Bt all the time? It could be because it was being created inside their own gut. So these are some examples of pretty significant and yucky ways in that GMOs can work on us and I want to double down on switching to organic and when you switch to organic I would like to recommend that you create a spreadsheet in fact even if you haven't switched to organic get a control where you get a spreadsheet percentage of GMOs that day right at the top your energy level your mood every symptom that you're dealing with one to ten then start making the change look at ev every day your symptoms, headache, pain, skin conditions, overweight, allergies, everything. See what changes. It turns out it's a holistic effect. A question earlier was what's the mode of action of Roundup? So many, I would say nearly all of the basic foundations of health are, are damaged by Roundup. GMOs, massive damage to virtually every system and organ tested. So the changes that occur with organic, and this I'm gonna leave you with this, can be life-changing, can give you more energy, more memory, more ability to concentrate, can take some of your chronic issues and leave them in the dust. We don't know, you don't know, it's worth the test. Give it a few weeks, see what happens. Some of you may notice changes within days and they may be very dramatic in the film secret ingredients some people were like that brain fog within three days it was like they woke up so i'd like to recommend that everyone starting today eat organic take notes and tell your friends great thank you so much for that very informative little scary uh um, presentation but something that we definitely need to hear if we could unmike the audience every other night